I wanted to start by reading, um, going back to 1 Peter chapter 2 and reading verses 9 through 12. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. A.W. <coughs> Tozer says, A genuine Christian should be a walking mystery because he is surely a walking miracle. A genuine Christian <coughs> should be a walking mystery because he is surely a walking miracle. Through the leading and power of the Holy Spirit, the Christian is involved in a daily life and habit that cannot be explained. A walking mystery because we are a walking miracle. And so our text begins this morning with a command. But I wanted to remind you that these commands, these imperatives that we've been given in Scripture follow the statements of truth that God gives us. Imperatives always come after the indicatives. And if we ever reverse that order, we will leave, lead a life of frustration. We will be like the hamster on the treadmill. <laughs> So I wanted to remind you who you are. Remember, God is grabbing you by the cheeks and he is telling you you're holy and you're chosen and you're dearly loved. And that should impact everything you do. And so we come to a section of scripture where we're given commands about how we should live. And our text this morning really begins in verse 18. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. As I began to study this week, I thought, oh great, those first two words, slaves submit. You just want to kind of say, oh, never mind. <laughs> we hear the concept of slave, first of all, and it kind of, it should, it kind of rears something up in us. Um, we want to run from it. And a lot of it is because of our picture, what we have in our mind of, of slavery. And I think we've got to dismiss that a little bit here because first century, what they would call a slave is very different from what we have known in our lifetime. And, and we probably don't have a great English word to, to, to totally explain what it means. Some translations say servants. But it would be someone who serves within a household. It, was the, it's, it wasn't the connotation of a 19th century slave 
That's not an accurate picture. They were generally well treated and were not only uh, unskilled laborers, but they were also managers, overseers, and trained members of various professions. A lot of them were doctors, nurses, teachers, teachers lawyers, things like that. And there were extensive Roman legislation that protected them. They were paid for their services and were generally pretty well taken care of and could expect to eventually purchase their freedom. Most of the slaves in the first century were actually born into these households. But obviously, from our text, there was still some mistreatment, right? There were masters who were unjust and who were harsh and perhaps did not treat their slaves with the greatest respect and honor that they deserved because they were created in the image of God. And so what Peter is saying, he's, he's saying if you find yourself in this position where you're employed, you're a part of a household where you're working for someone who is treating you unjustly, then I want you to think about how you can respond in a way that what would point to your ultimate master to the fact that you're, you're a free man and you're a slave to God. And I want you to do this in a way that is counterculture. And perhaps for us, the best thing that we can compare it to is maybe an employer and an employee relationship. And some of us would say, well, right now, God has not called me to that. I'm not in that position. I'm, perhaps I, I work out of my home, or perhaps I'm not employed outside of my home or doing those things. Perhaps I'm a student. But we all find ourselves in our various callings under the authority of certain people. And we definitely have people in our life that we need to encourage along these lines. Perhaps we have a spouse who's employed, or a child, or a parent. <laughs> And so we see the Word of God, again, is practical and it speaks truth into those difficult places of our lives. We see that word submit. And again, many of us, <laughs> something begins to boil within us. Mm, don't like that word. Submit? Really? And as we move through the text in 1 Peter, we're going to find that this idea of submission and authority perhaps gets a little more personal and a little more intimate in the relationships that it speaks to. Why do we struggle with that in the first place? Authority at all. Basically, we need to understand that we are very prideful people and at the root of a lot of our sin is that, you know what, we want to be God. We want to be in control. And we want to be the one who makes all the decisions about what we do, how we do it, and when we do it. And God has already said to us that He is the one who puts people in these positions of authority. And I want to remind you too that authority is not a result of the fall. It was in place prior to the fall. So the Word tells us that we are to submit or we are to come up under or to be sub subject to our masters with all respect. With respect. Not necessarily because they've earned respect, but simply because of the position they're in. That God has put them in a position that has said, you will respect them to some degree. It may be better translated here, that idea of fear. And I know we've wrestled with that a lot in our study of 1 Peter. What does it look like to live in fear? We know that it's not an unhealthy God, is not a God of fear. And yet we see this idea of fearing God and living with reverence and fear. It's a healthy desire to avoid the displeasure of this master, this person that God is put over us. We don't want to displease him. We want to do things that he asks us to do in a way that ultimately what pleases the Father. Because we recognize that ultimately we're not working for this person, but we're working for the Lord. And so Peter encourages us to submit to him with all respect. And he says, not only to those people over us that are good and considerate, 
but also to those who are harsh, or some of your translations may say unjust. There are things they're doing that just don't seem right. People are suffering for making the right decisions and for doing things that are good. And Peter goes on to say, For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. It is commendable. In some of our translations it says, It is a gracious thing. It is a gracious thing if a man bears up under unjust suffering. It is only an act of grace that we are able to unjustly suffer. Now this idea of pain here does not probably infer physical abuse. We're not talking about staying in relationships where you are abused physically. But this idea of pain is various kinds of mental anguish. Some type of emotional draining and oppression that these people feel under this unjust and harsh. And I don't know if some of you right now are thinking about times in your life, perhaps you've worked for someone like that. Perhaps you know someone, someone you love has been in a difficult situation where they have not been treated justly or what we consider fairly for the things that they are doing. And so Peter, Peter tells us the way that we can bear up under that is to be conscious of God. To be mindful of God. And I thought about that a lot, and I wanted to see if I could define that. And it's a kind of difficult to define, but I want to give you this definition. It's a trusting awareness of God's presence and never failing care. That we're conscious of who God is, that we're mindful of Him as we do our work, that we have a trusting awareness of God's presence and never failing care. I know in my own life I have had a situation where I worked in a very difficult place under a boss that I felt was often unjust and made it somewhat oppressive for me to be there. And some days, the only thing that would keep me focused and able to do my work well was to be conscious of who God was. I had verses where I worked on my desk and my podium. And I was able to focus on who God is and what He was doing in my life. And many times I had to remind myself of passages like 1 Corinthians 10, 21. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Or if you look in Colossians chapter 3, we're told in verse 17, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And if you go on down to verse 23 in chapter 3 of Colossians, it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance, that inheritance, that imperishable inheritance that is stored up for you from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. We must be mindful of God and conscious of of God. And the text is also going to give us, it's kind of going to kind of expand this idea as we think through what else Peter has to say to us through these words. How can we be mindful of God in these difficult situations? What are the things that we need to be thinking? And Peter says, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? <laughs> Why is it to your credit if you deserve to be punished and you're punished? Why, if you receive a beating for doing what and wrong and endurance, is that a great thing? But, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. This is a gracious thing before God. Carol Ruvalo says in her book, when God's people behave righteously in the midst of harsh treatment, they reflect their reliance on their Father's promises. 
When they refuse to sin in response to unreasonableness, they display their free submission to God's commands. And when they patiently endure the sorrows of this life, they reveal the beauty of their living hope. Such behavior finds favor with God. Why? Because it glorifies Him. And this is counterculture. This is counter human nature. Because our first response in these unjust and difficult situations is that we feel like what? That we need to retaliate, we need to defend ourselves, we need to provide justice, and we need to step into those situations and make things right. I know that's a struggle for me. I'm always wanting to make things right. And I think I constantly have to use my words and not just my actions to show people this glorious God who is the only one that can transform their hearts. Peter goes on to tell us in verse 21, he says, To this you were called. <laughs> to this you were called. To suffer. <laughs> to bear up under suffering. To this you were called. In chapter 2, verse 12, that we read at the beginning, to this you were called, to live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. To this you were called. Edmund Clowney says this, Peter does not ask us to view suffering as inevitable in the world under the curse. He does not ask for stoic resignation. A life of suffering is our calling, not our fate. It is our calling just because we are God's people. He does not ask us to view suffering as inevitable in the world under the curse. He does not ask for stoic resignation. A life of suffering is our calling, not our fate. It is our calling just because we are God's people. Romans 8 verse 17 says, Now if we are children, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance and the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We're called to suffer. But our suffer has meaning. And as we move through the text, the example that we're given is Jesus Christ himself. Why did Jesus suffer? He suffered for the sake of God's purpose and for the salvation of others. Jesus Christ suffered for the sake of God's purpose and the salvation of others. And we do the same. We suffer for His sake, for His glory, and for His honor, for His purposes to be accomplished in our lives, through us, and around us, and the people that we come in contact with. For the sake of what? For the sake of winning others to, to His saving gospel. 
Your suffering is not in vain. It has purpose. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we read these words. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight that far outweighs them all. It's achieving something. It's accomplishing something. And Peter goes on to say, To this you were called... Because, what? Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And we go on to read of what this example was like. The scripture tells us he committed no sin. <laughs> All right, I'm already done. <laughs> no deceit was found in his mouth. When he insulted, when he was insulted, he did not retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. But he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. But I want you to understand something here. That it's clear in this passage that Jesus is not just our example. <laughs> He's not simply a guide into what we're supposed to be like. He is our motivation. And the fact that he was the suffering servant. And he died in our place. And he rose again on our behalf. Gives us the power to fulfill our purpose. To declare his excellencies. To live such good lives that we're not capable of living in and of ourselves. He's not just an example. We can't have a gospel that just says, just be like Jesus. We have to have a God. We have to have a Savior who provides a way for us to do that. 2 Corinthians 5, I know you hear me read this or quote this all the time. One of my favorite passages in, in Scripture, but 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 tells us this, For Christ's love compels us. It compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all. Why? That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. Jesus is not just our example. We can't in and of ourselves just go and be like Jesus. But when we begin to see him as that suffering servant who did all this, who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth and did not retaliate when he was insulted and did not... Um, when he was threatened, did not insult back. But he did what? He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When we place our trust in the Savior, the suffering servant, we are then empowered to follow in his steps. The scripture tells us that he did these things and was able to do these things because he did entrust himself to him who judges justly. And as I looked a little bit more closely at this verb and read it in different translations, some of them said he continued entrusting himself. And I thought about that. And what impact that would have on my life. You understand it's not just a one-time thing, but it's that daily, daily, what I'm going to God and I'm saying, God, I'm entrusting myself to you. I'm entrusting myself in this difficult situation. I'm entrusting myself to you who judges justly. And that is going to give me the power to live in a way that brings glory and honor to you. I'm continually entrusting and giving myself and handing myself over 
to the ultimate and the perfect judge. We are told in Scripture that God will ultimately right all wrongs. And we have that comfort and hope. And that is one reason that we don't have to always feel that we have to be the one to bring about justice. Colossians 3 verse 25 says, Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. And there is no favoritism. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 and 6 says this. I'm in 1 Thessalonians. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. And in James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. God will ultimately right all wrongs. And in Romans chapter 12, which is a quote from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 32, we read this, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And we are encouraged in chapter 12 to not repay evil for evil, but to be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. But I have to tell you that I was also convicted a little bit in my study as I thought about this. Because if I'm honest with you about my heart, and maybe even what you're thinking right now, as you think about some of these situations perhaps that you've been in or someone you love has been in. By entrusting ourselves to him who judges justly, there's a part of me that's like, oh, you're going to get it. One day you're going to get it. And I realize that even in that, there's so much sin in my heart. Because why? What was the real example that Jesus gave to us? When he went to the cross, when he bore our sins, as it tells us on that tree, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so when I entrust myself to someone who judges justly, I realize that his arm is not too short to reach that unjust and harsh authority in my life. And I recognize that forgiveness doesn't come without a cost. But perhaps the forgiveness, the justice that that person deserves can be paid for by the great cost of the blood of Christ. Do you see, God does judge justly. And He will either judge us based on the merits of His Son and cover us with the righteousness of Christ. And we will be forgiven. And it will be just at a great cost. And if we are resting and trusting in that work, then that will never have to be paid for again. And so when I long, when I entrust myself to him who judges justly, what am I really longing for in that person, that difficult authority in my life? Am I longing that the Father would forgive them? For they know not what they do? And am I recognizing that even, yes, even their sin can be paid for as mine has by the precious blood of Christ? Peter goes on to tell us that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. 
And I think one of the things that this phrase does is that it really does give us a picture of suffering. I mean, that word that he bore our sins. And he uses the word tree to point us back to Old Testament. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. And he was under God's curse on our behalf. And again, what this does is it doesn't just give us an example, but it gives us a motivation. And it reminds us that we have the power because of what Christ has done to live contrary to our human nature, not controlled by the sins that rule and reign over us, dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have brought, been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but you're under grace. Offer your very lives as an instrument of righteousness. He bore our sins on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. You were made whole. You're alive. And that gives us the power to fulfill our purpose. Peter goes on to say that we were like sheep going astray. And we're reminded how desperately we needed a Savior. Now I want you to notice that we were sheep. We weren't goats. We were sheep. We were part of his flock. But we were like sheep who were going astray. Wendell Winkler says that sheep go astray by preoccupation. They get lost because of carelessness. They get lost because they become too involved with their worldly pursuits. And they get lost because they nibble at sin. Sheep are dumb. They're directionless. They're defenseless. They're defenseless. 
If you read some about this, you'll hear about sheep who walk off cliffs and the whole flock follows the first one. You'll read how sheep wander off because they think that the pasture that their shepherd has put them in is not really where they belong or what they need. And if you put them out in the wild, they'll never survive without their shepherd. They're completely and totally dependent upon the shepherd. And when the shepherd speaks, they should follow because his plan for them is better than their plan for themselves. When the shepherd speaks, they should follow because his plan for them is better than the plan that they have for themselves. This whole account in 1 Peter is drawn from an Old Testament text, Isaiah 53. And I wanted to take just a few minutes to read from Isaiah 53. And I want you to listen to the language that's reflected in 1 Peter. And I want you to hear the heart of your suffering servant. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely... He took our, up our affirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his, her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the trans transgression of my people he was stricken. He was a signed a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. It was the Lord's will to crush him. His suffering had purpose. It accomplished something. It accomplished your salvation if you're trusting in him and what he did. And I guess one of the things that's kind of hard to stomach about 1 Peter is that we're also told that we're called to this. That in a sense, it's God's will that we should suffer. But do you understand the comfort that comes from that when you recognize the fact, fact that nothing that comes into your life is outside the hand of God? And God knows the best way for us to bring glory to Him. And sometimes, sometimes, ladies, it's by miraculously escaping suffering. And sometimes, perhaps more often, it's by graciously bearing suffering that we don't deserve from men. <clears throat> 
Because why? Because we trust in God. The Heidelberg Catechism says this, and I kept, it kept coming to my mind as I studied this passage. The question that it asks is, what is your only comfort in life and death? What is your only comfort in life and death? And this is the answer, that I am not my own. But I belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my Heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. But now you have returned to the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely... Goodness and mercy will follow me, what, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in your house forever. He's your shepherd. And he's the overseer of your souls. He watches over. It's a charge to protect and preserve it all. And he sees over everything that is happening, the bigger picture. And nothing comes into your life that doesn't flow from his hand. We have to be reminded, why? Why in the world would I be called to bear up under suffering? Why would I be asked to do such a thing? And we're reminded because of what was told to us before, that we are what? To declare the excellencies, the praises of what? Of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. But how does this do that? And I wanted to read to you, a list of something that John Piper says. He says, When we suffer unjustly and patiently with our trust in God, we are surrendering some very precious things. Health, comfort, ease. And we show the excellency of God's superior preciousness. Do you remember that? The stone, the cornerstone will be what? Will be precious to you. And it will be more precious to you than your comfort or your lack of pain, or your ease of life. When we suffer with patient faith in God, we surrender much of our claim to be protected and cared for on earth. And so we show the excellency of God's superior shepherd care for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When we suffer with patient faith in God, we go without the glory of fighting back and winning. And so we show the excellency of God's superior glory that he will share with us someday and the justice of his throne that will one day settle all accounts. When we suffer with patient faith in God, we seem to take a tremendous risk with our life, the only life most people believe we have to enjoy. And so we show the excellency of God's faithfulness and trustworthiness. When we seem to throw away our one chance for happiness by not fighting for more comforts here, and so we show the excellency of God's power to raise us from the dead as a faithful creator and one who has all dominion in the universe. 
And finally, when we endure unjust suffering meekly by trusting in God, we acknowledge that we're still sinners and are not earning anything by this patience. And so we know the excellency of God's great grace. It's a gracious thing if you bear up under the suffering. It's a gracious thing to God. What is your only comfort in life and death? That you're not your own, but you belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all of your sins with his precious blood and has set you free from all the powers of the devil. And he preserves you in such a way that without the will of your heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from your head. Indeed, all things must work together for your salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures you of eternal life and makes you heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your word and we thank you for the reminder this morning of Jesus Christ, our suffering servant, for the one who went before us, for the one who bore our sins on the tree in order that what? In order that we might be dead to our sin and might live to righteousness in order that every spiritual blessing that belongs to Christ is ours. And Lord, we thank you that he's not just an example to us. But he's our motivation. He's our power to fulfill our purpose. To declare your excellencies, your praises to this world. And we thank you, Father, that we can rest and be assured that not a hair falls from our head without it coming from your hand. Whatever touches us, whatever comes into our life. And Lord, we thank you that we know and we can believe and we can be confident that our suffering has purpose. And the purpose is for your glory and for the salvation of many souls. Father, make us children that delight in pleasing our Father. And give us the grace that we need to bear up under our suffering for the glory of who you are, for all that you are done, have done to us. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.